Okay, so if you have played through chapter 5 at all, you have probably noticed that a particular character is uh, a bit different this time around, right? Now, this is a character that we have seen before. This is a character that uh, is reoccurring. They've spoken to us on many, many occasions. However, in, the, in this um, iteration of the story, they are presenting maybe a little bit differently than we had um, initially uh, known them, right? And today we're going to go ahead and take a look at why that might be, you know, some of the causes, what it could possibly mean for the story, um, etc, etc. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and take a look. And of course, the character that I am talking about is, for lack of a better title, the narrator. Now, the narrator that we have known prior to Chapter 5 is um, presents more of a masculine sort of voice. It's, it's very rough, it's very gruff and brusque. Um, and in terms of his disposition when interacting with us, seems more like rude and even like adversarial at times, uh, as if his entire purpose of speaking with us is to consistently just put us down uh, and call us basically worthless, right? Um, meanwhile, the character in chapter uh, 5, the, the narrator in that chapter, is taking a drastically different approach to how they interact with us. They are almost maternal in a way. Um, they are definitely a lot more gentle in the way they address us. Um, they, they act more as a guiding force rather than a force that is meant to kind of trample over us, right? And unlike the initial voice, who never really gives us hints towards their identity besides some very cryptic clues that don't really give us any information, this new voice actively refers to herself as a grandmother figure or granny. But, but why the change, right? Why the shift? What is the significance of this? Well, there are several reasons why something like this might have happened. Um, I think there are two very likely reasons, however, only one of them really piques my interest. The other one is more hand-waving it away. Uh, I'll mention it, but I don't think it's super likely, right? Um, and that would be that this was just a purely logistics issue. They weren't able to, whatever reason, they weren't able to get the original voice actor. Um, there maybe was a scheduling conflict, who knows? And the reason I think this one is highly unlikely is because they addressed the shift within the game. Um, they, they very bluntly call out the fact that our narrator is now different. Um, and they call it out multiple times over the course of a single um, interaction, right? Um, and I think that if this had been a primarily a logistics issue, a scheduling conflict, that they probably wouldn't have paid as much attention to it. They would have just kind of hand waved over it and brushed over it and just hoped the audience forgets, right? Um, more than that, if this had been something unintended, um, I don't think there would have been a reason for them to have so drastically shifted over um, the, the tone of the narrator as much as they did. They most likely would have tried to find someone who at least sounds or acts the same, one, same way that our established narrator always had, right? Which leads us to the second option. And that second option is that the narrator is potentially reflecting a shift in the way we, or Verton, kind of sees the world, right? It does kind of reflect a facet of Burton that has slowly been um, shifting throughout the course of the story. I have actually spoken about this change before, right? Uh, if you are, if you have seen my uh, video on biblical illusions within Reverse 1999, which you know, if you haven't, <coughs> right? Um, Towards the end of that video, I talk about how Verton appears within Chapter 3 and Chapter 4, specifically within the context of artificial somnambulism, right? And I kind of alluded to the fact that artificial somnambulism kind of mirrors this idea both of uh, Christ's sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane, as well as... Um, after being crucified, Christ going down into limbo to raise up the spirits of the righteous who were either never baptized or not Christian, right? Um, and it's kind of this idea of a journey of self-idealization, right? Self-actualization, maybe not a full actualization of the self, but enough so that you kind of see the world in a different light at the very least. And this matches Verton, right? Because 
as she is going through her past, we see the things that are weighing her down, the things that uh, that kind of rest heavy on her shoulders, the things that is kind of holding her back from interacting with human or other people, rather, right? And as a result, her inner monologue, which I sometimes believe might be this personification of the narrator, is more deprecating towards her. It insults her. It it at every turn it takes every option to tear her down. Um, and I think that this is her kind of idealization of the world as a whole, of of how the world is uncaring, of how she as a person is kind of destruct destructive towards those around her, how her presence might actually cause pain and suffering because of who she is as a person. However, after going through some Namulism, after going through her own past, uh, sell, sell, settling the baggage, um, kind of reassessing her own mental state, we get the scene towards the end of chapter four, where she is greeted by the people that she has saved, the people that she has met, right? And I think it's at this point where she kind of realizes that the world may be not as dim as that she had initially um, thought, right? Because we see that she kind of recognizes there are people who rely on her. There are people who are there to kind of back her up when things get tough. There are people who are willing to stand by her side, regardless of what kind of person she is or was. So in a way, it's more this idea of the world opening up before you, the world being a bit more accepting. And in some ways, I kind of see chapter four as um, almost a threshold, right? It is a demarcation between the way that we were previously and the way that we will be going forwards, right? Because even if Burton hasn't completely reconciled with her own baggage, even if she hasn't completely reconciled with her past or anything like that, um, she at least has had enough of a shift that she can recognize that the world doesn't have to be um, this way. The burdens that she carries does not only have to uh, lie upon her shoulders, that there are people who are willing to take up those burdens alongside her. And this, um, this ideation of the world, this voice that is either speaking to her or to us directly kind of reflects that, right? It is no longer as uh, deprecating as it was. Instead, now it's been taken um, more of a almost nurturing role, right? It'll, it'll still be kind of snarky towards us. It's still kind of teasing. Um, but at the same time, rather than being someone who will constantly put us down, it is now kind of implied that this voice at least has our best interests at heart if not um, just enough to keep us, you know, on the right path. And that's about it, really. Uh, TLDR, this voice, this narrator that has undergone this drastic, drastic shift from Chapter 4 to Chapter 5, is supposed to mirror Verton's own kind of journey, her own shift in mentality between those two chapters. Um, now, are there other options, are there other reasons, rather, why the shift might have happened? Are there other factors that could explain this? Possibly, probably. Um, these are just the ones that I thought were most likely and the ones that immediately came to mind more than anything else. And, you know, if you have any other ideas about this, any insights that I might have missed, always let me go ahead and let me know. Otherwise, um, that'll be the video. And thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.